Hi, I'm Renee Seltzer, owner of Ellison Ellery Consulting. We are a full-blown agency, but today's session is actually not going to be about us. We're walking through a case study for Magnet Remodeling, which is a home remodeling company in Orlando, Florida. And you're probably thinking, this isn't applicable to my business. I have a SaaS company or a B2B company, high red. Well, it is going to be applicable because the things that we're talking about are different tactics and strategies that everybody should be applying to their business, no matter what industry. So you're going to have healthcare, travel, B2B, B2C, high red. These tips are going to be able to be applied for everybody. You're going to come back into the office and share some of the things that you got from this and really have a good move, what to do moving forward. And you're, you're going to feel a lot of love today. So do stick with us. This is going to be super informative and we're just going to rock it. All right. I am Renee Seltzer. I have 20 years of B2B and B2C experience. And Ellison Ellery is an inbound marketing agency. So we're focused on growth. And most of the tactics and strategies that we implement for clients are all about how do we get them to grow. All right, let's get started. You can tell there's a chicken in the back. And if you start following our TikTok channel, you'll start to see why that chicken is important. It shows up in different places. Okay, so Magnet Remodeling, when we started and engaged with them a few months ago, they had no email system, CRM, no landing pages, a poorly designed website, which I will show you, and visual identity that needed a lot of help, right? So they, they needed work. One of the first things, let's start with your brand identity because that's the cornerstone of all that we're going to do, right? If you have the wrong brand identity, everything from that kind of will suffer and struggle. And brand identity is so much more than just business cards and logos, right? So it is, what is your value proposition? What is your brand personality? What's the mood that you want people to take away from your brand? Who do you want to be in the marketplace? And who are you talking to? And that, pro that all goes under your brand identity. People are likely to spend 71% higher on products where they trust the brand. And I'll give you an example. When we first engaged with Magnet Remodeling, they were actually called Magnet Group. And when we first started with them, they were charging about $1,400 for jobs. Now they get over $100,000. Their amount of experience hasn't changed. Nothing about them has changed, but their brand perception in the marketplace is completely elevated. And we'll show you a lot of the pieces of how we got there. So that's why this use case is going to be so um, helpful for all kinds of businesses. So first, when we started engaged with them, they're called Magna Group, and you can see the logo there. When I Googled that, I saw that there was actually a couple other businesses called Magnet Group. And I felt, you know, before we really go deep into spending money and investing in marketing, let's make sure we have a name that no one is going to um, say that you can't use that name. So we adjusted it to Magnet Remodeling, which actually tells people more of what they do. They focus on home and commercial, so that's their tagline. And we kept the, the, the coloring the, similar. We also help them get car wraps for their trailers and their trucks, right? So here's one of their trailers. And we really focused on the car wraps because they're driving billboards. He said that at one point, this the trailer was just sitting in his driveway. Someone drove by and gave him a $100,000 job just from that trailer and the car wrap because they looked like the kind of company that could handle a $100,000 project. Some of the other things that we gave them and worked with them is sales enablement materials. So we noticed that sometimes they were going out on free estimates and they weren't always getting the job. And so what we wanted to do is enable them to get more of that. And that's called sales enablement. And we created a, a checklist for the buyers to help the buyers refine what they're looking for, an about us page, a folder, business cards, and they would hand that off to prospective customers. And again, it leaves them with something tangible. In a world of digital, we still do want to leave people with something tangible. One thing that I didn't include in here is that after the customer purchases, we also have thank you cards, which actually I think are in this video, that have a QRC code that goes to their Google page so people can leave reviews right onto their Google business. So what we want to do is really kind of short that process out and, and ensure that they're getting reviews and that we're thinking about a referral program for them. And we're thinking about how to give them a gift at the end of the project to encourage more people to leave reviews. So one of the things that we also changed for them right at the beginning is we gave them a new website, right? So their website was very dated, as you'll see here. Even though it was a brand new website, they didn't pay a lot of money for it, and they got a site that looks like they didn't pay a lot of money for it. So we redesigned their whole website, gave them a very robust site, great user experience gallery because they're selling the visuals, and a whole blog 
part of the website where it gets updated constantly. And we're going to cover some blogging in a moment and how important it is for your business to blog, why every business should be blogging, and then also what are some best practices of blogging. We want you to own your brand. What does that mean? That means every little piece of your brand needs to be polished. So here was their YouTube channel, and then we went ahead and refined it. So when people visit, while they don't have a lot of subscribers, some of their videos have 16,000 views, 10,000 views, so people are watching the videos. We wanna make sure they're done well, and everything is just polished, because we don't want to have somebody visit their Facebook page, their Instagram, their YouTube, and, and feel like, well, I'm not really, they lose credibility and trust, right? People are willing to pay more if they trust you. Blogging and the importance of CTAs. CTAs are call to action. You have to drive someone and tell them what to do next, right? Sometimes you get to a website and you're like, I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to go or what to do. So what you wanna do is, like this guy with the net, you want to capture as many people who visit your website or social media accounts into something. You wanna drive them what we call lead magnet, and I'll show you what that is in a moment. That goes for higher ed, for business. You wanna drive people to that mini conversion. A lot of times on Facebook, people will run ads, and what happens is they're trying to make the sale on Facebook at that moment, and that's not what you do. You drive them to a mini conversion, like just visit the website. Once they get to the website, then you drive them to maybe a home checklist, or an infographic, or a quiz, something, and I'll, I'll give you some more examples in a moment, but you want to capture that person's contact info and nurture them, and I will cover that again. But you have to think about it. You're not trying to marry someone the second you meet them. You're trying to just build a little bit rapport and then maybe get their phone number. And then from their phone number and email, you're gonna you know, maybe send some cute little text messages to them or some emails. And what you're trying to do is woo them and build trust. Very few, few people are in market to buy right now. So you have to build that long-term relationship. So I wanted to show you, here's examples of CTAs. You can see my clicker is pointing on different parts. You embed them into your blog. You put them on the side of your blog. You encourage people to sign up for your newsletter. Video, which I'll show you some stats about, really dramatically increase your conversion rates on your blog post. So make sure you're incorporating video into your blog post. Lists are really important. Images are really important. So when you're doing blogs, here's another CTA, and then it goes to this next page. This next page right here is called a lead magnet. What we're trying to do is capture the person and give them something of value in exchange for their contact info. So in this case, that's the checklist. That's also the checklist that we show that we print out and we give to a prospective customer. But in this case, you could download it as a PDF and print it out yourself too. Something really important is how to drive people to your website. You have to make sure you have the right keywords. And this is an example, we do keyword research. You can do it on your own. There's a lot of tools like SEMrush and AREFs. And you would do the keyword to understand what are people looking for. And then you create content to match what they are looking for. And that is intense. I do wanna share this one stat. Companies spend 76% of their budget targeting the wrong keywords. That's because they, they're either going to keywords that have zero intent. For example, I work with a big university and a lot of their keyword searches are like how to do MLA format. And I'm like, the people who are typing that keyword in are already in college because as an adult, I do not need to know how to do that formatting. So those people have zero intent of enrolling and signing up. So you really have to match and understand intent and create user experiences that match where they are. And I'll show you a funnel in a second to make this all make more sense. But call to actions is one of the biggest things that you can do to your website right now is to create really strong call to actions throughout your site and on your blog post. Anchor text versus end of post banner CTAs. This means that a lot of people put their call to action at the very bottom of their blog post. But you actually want to put it up way high into your blog post, maybe after like a paragraph or two. HubSpot did this test, and 93% of their post leads came from anchor text. That means it's inside the body of the copy, and then it's also just the text link to a call to action. So it doesn't have to always be a graphic. Sometimes just having a hyperlink text link is all that you need, and you can have really great results from that. So make sure you go back and do a content audit and reevaluate all of your links and make sure that your CTAs are all strong and they're driving either people to yeah, learn more or do a demo, but remember that's really low, that that person's already sold on you. So you have to think about before they get to that, how do you woo them up high when they're not quite sold on you yet? What's the content they need so you can move them down the sales process? Here's another CTA, 
Battery Modeling Project in mind, how you word your CTAs, your button, be sure that you test those things. Button color, button size, messaging, those are all really important. And one of your most important things to test are your CTAs. So be sure to think of different ways that you can make them better and then test them. And you may do a couple tests and find your original one was the best. One that validates it. And two, um, you just keep testing. It's not about always improving. It's about identifying which ones are working, which ones aren't, so you could improve and learn from each one. So you want to test all those. Here's another example, a free download. This one is to that mini lean magnet, right? It's not to schedule a demo. So people who schedule a demo are more sold, and that's why you have a higher conversion rate of your demos. The goal is to engage more people into your process to help them become sold on you. See right here where it says in the pink or red or whatever color, home remodeling checklist. That's an anchor text to CTA. So that's what we're talking about. You could also have the graphic inside, but those anchor text CTAs have been showing to you really, really well. So make sure you put those in too. Here, you know, as CTAs, the lean magnets can be ebooks, they can be infographics, they could be a whole bunch of other things. And I did not realize this would be so small, but this is your funnel, right? You're driving awareness at the very top of it. And that's where you're doing ebooks and checklists and infographics and quizzes. You're trying to get that person not specifically to be in your sales process. People don't want to be sold to. They just want to learn more and become a better buyer. And that's what you're going for. If you go ahead and email me or go to our website, we'll get you that document where you can see it a lot better. Here's an infographic. You can create them on all kinds of amazing topics. The great thing is if you start creating really, really good content and really great infographics, people will inherently link to you and that will help your website search engine optimization. But you have to think about, I'm going to invest in marketing. I'm going to create really amazing assets, not just 500 word blogs, but really, really good assets that people are wanting to engage with. So we got to break internet, right? So you've heard me say this, we want to test. This is where you don't set it and forget it. It's iterations. You put it out there, you see how the market is relating to it, and then you make adjustments. You change the verbiage, you change the buttons, you change the call to actions. You, you really keep adjusting it. So I, not to harbor, like to really go in on blogging, but on the impact of monthly blog posts on inbound traffic, it's huge. So if, the more blogs you could produce on a monthly basis, obviously the more index traffic you're going to get. It is a commitment, it's an investment, and as you're creating these pieces of content, whether you're working with an agency or in-house, you're gonna have, I call this the trough of despair. That's where you're producing all this content and you don't see any ROI for it. There is a time where you have to get economies of scale, like you have to do enough of it in order for it to work, and then you have to keep going with it. So once you start to see your traffic on an uptick, that's not the time to say, oh, we've invested enough, let's put money somewhere else. Or, hey, this channel is really inexpensive. I don't want to keep investing to make this channel more. Because if these leads are converting into sales and revenue for you, then you want to do as much as you possibly can in this channel, even if your cost per leads or cost um, per revenue uh, acquisition go up, if this is a good channel for you. Here's an example of the blog that we created just for Magnet, because we're using this as a use case, right? So we, we work with lots of other companies, but we're specifically showing you all the ways that we modernize this one specific company. So there's pages and pages of blog posts. You want to make sure that you have authors, not staff writer, and that you have bios, because that really helps with this whole thing with Google called EAT, expertise, authority, and trust, right? So if you have a staff writer that's just unknown, that's a lot less trust. So you want to make sure you have that. As you can see right here where it says get a free estimate, well, that's another call to action to sign up for them. So we have those all over. Send us an email at the very top. We also do call tracking on this. So the phone numbers on the website actually change all the time because they're part of a call tracking system. And you want to set that up on your website. And there is a little bit more of a cost for it, but incredibly worth it. So set up call tracking on your website, set up separate calls on email, set up separate calls on social media, so that way you start to see which channels are driving you those calls and those revenue opportunities. Blogs keep getting longer. So what I wanted to show is every year you have to become more of an authority. There was a time where an 800 word blog was great. Now it's 1400, if not more, and you need lots of images. You need to make sure, in this case, you have lists. You're making your blogs very searchable by somebody skimming it, right? That's how people read, they skim. So if you just have 
it as like text it looks a lot like an essay and that seems like work and nobody wants to do work these days so make your blogs really skimmable with lists with bullets with headers and you know here why do we need lists because they work <laughs> so make sure you do that blog posts containing a video can get up to 48 percent more views compared with blogs without videos and we're going to have a video section in just a moment but videos are incredibly important and it's important that your blogs have lots of images sometimes as many as seven images and you want to optimize those images for the web so don't like download stock photos and upload it just like that because that photo file will be huge there's tools that you could use to minify the file size and that takes an extra step and you want to optimize each of those images for Google search so each don't just say photo one photo two photo three you want the photo to be descriptive of what that content is about or what that photo is about and that has a chance to show up land pages and page search right so if you're not familiar with landing pages often they're used in page search for Google Ads you don't normally send them to a regular website page because the website page isn't made to convert that person as well as a landing page will be made for that. So let's say you're typing in Google and you're like, I want to find home remodeling in Orlando, right? Here's one of their apps, home renovation Orlando magnet remodeling, right? All right, and then the little R for register actually has shown to really improve your click-through rate. So be sure to include that if that's um, your brand. And then we have a description and sometimes depending on Google, we have all the extensions Sometimes Google shows those extensions, sometimes they don't. But we make sure that every extension, image extension, phone extension, every image extension in Google Ads is filled out because that will help you with your conversions. In this case, we're optimizing for calls, so there's a phone number there. And then you'll start to see revenue for Google. This is why I'm showing you this. Obviously, Google keeps making more money year after year after year after year. And some of the ways that they do that is because there's more advertisers, and advertisers are willing to spend a lot more money for those ads. Why? Because they work, right? So the uh, people who search on Google generally are very high intent. They're looking for something specific, they have a pain point, and they're looking for a resolution to solve it. So they're lower on the funnel, and they're really looking to, they're closer to the end sale. So that's why people are willing to pay a lot more money per click for them. But you have to make sure you are not lighting money on fire. This is where CRO testing, conversion rate optimization testing, is so incredibly important. And I'm going to cover that in a sec. But right now, if you are not managing your Google Ads well, if your landing pages are not optimized for conversion, and you are not constantly testing your landing pages, then you're really lighting money on fire and really just kind of doing an exchange directly from your pocket into Google's pocket. Here are examples. We have a variety of different landing pages we've created. This isn't even all of them. Where we have different types of forms. You could see like the girl right here, she has a very mini form because that's Facebook and on Facebook people only are going to give you a very tiny bit of information. On the next one the form is a little bit below there's a button that says go to form and then that form is below some of those images. On the one to the left the form is way up high and it starts that way. And then what we look at is conversion rate. We also have heat mapping with hot jar or mouse flow and you can look at how people engage with it. But you want to create many different variables on your landing page. You want to test different form sizes, different lengths, do not have 12 form fields on your website forms. Uh, the very minimum. I see in higher ed, they're asking people for their birthday. I'm like, why do you need your birthday at this point? You don't. They're trying to fill out every piece of information in their CRM, and we don't want you to do that. We want to have the minimum amount of information that you need to do the next step, right? That person is not committed enough and knows enough about you to want to give you all those pieces of info. So don't do it. But test what you can and work with your sales team to understand they're going to get less. But there's also different tools like in B2B where you could augment that data and fill it out with more points of data. So you just pay for an extra service to help you with that. But don't ask the customer to do it. That's not their job is to make your job easier for you. You want to make sure all of your landing pages and your website are mobile friendly and they load quickly for mobile as much as like 60% of all searches are coming from mobile. So you want to make sure your Google ads are optimized for mobile. You want to make sure your Google My Google business profile is optimized for mobile. And then you want to make sure your landing pages are also looking great on mobile, right? And that your forms are really easy to fill out on mobile. So make sure you're doing that. Videos can increase conversions by 80% when implemented on a landing page. So that's a little bit different than a blog. You want on your pages that are going to convert for Google um, and Facebook to have some video content on there, right? Because you can increase your conversions as much as 
the cost per click from Google is going to stay the same. So your job is to try to get more of those people who click over to fill out a form or to call you to be a conversion. But the cost is $8.40 a click. And whether zero people fill out a form or 100% of those people fill out a form will be the difference of how much money you make, right? And then, so, but I also want to say, when you're looking at your landing pages, you have to think of it as a funnel. It is not just one page, it's your thank you page. And then it's also your first set of emails and different pieces. So you wanna look at your customer journey. How, what is the CTA? What's the blog post I'm driving them to? What's the CTA that makes sense to that blog post? What's the landing page that makes sense to that CTA? What's the thank you page that makes sense? And the next step. And then are you putting them on different email tracks based on how they started with you? So you really want to map out your customer journey and create the right pieces of content to match that journey. All right, social. So Facebook and um, Instagram are different, right? So I said you want, you want to have different landing pages that target Facebook and you want different landing pages that target Google and you want to evaluate them differently. Facebook is generally a very high awareness and you want to drive them to that mini conversion rate, right? Not schedule a demo, but like what's that little thing that you can give them that's high value, low involvement for them? For, because they're, they're going on Facebook to look at their cousin's vacation photos. They're not like, hey, I need a new SaaS product or I need a home remodeling company. They're, they're in a different mindset, so you have to work with that different mindset. And you also have to create ads where you can gauge their attention within like the first three seconds, right? So you really wanna capture their attention because otherwise they're just thumbing, right? They're just going through it and not paying attention. There's a lot of strategy and a lot of thinking that you're gonna go through when you create your landing pages. So you're gonna find pages that you like, pieces that you like, what's the story that you're gonna be telling and all of that. So that goes into your landing pages. But don't, don't just kind of make it and forget it. This is where you can catch money on fire. And then the second part of that is, okay, you have these great landing pages, you're testing, but now I need you to look at the metrics. What's converting and can you see it all the way through the sales process? Make sure you have like a unique identifier or something like that where you could track this person from what keyword they used, what source they used, and then do they ultimately end up converting or not? So it's really important. The importance of video. So I'm just kind of going to read a couple of these. Video needs to be a bigger part of your strategy. Everybody says, yeah, they want to do more video, but they don't actually do more video. Viewers can retain 95% of what they see and only 10% of what they read. You don't have to have these really high budget productions like this. You could actually do something as basic as this for your company, right? We did this for home magnet remodeling. This, we asked the customer right here, they actually, her seven-year-old daughter is filming this. She just emailed it and texted it to me. So she did it herself with her daughter and she's giving a testimonial of a happy customer and it, it could be completely user generated and then we just added some of the embellishment for the video and like edited it a little bit. But it doesn't have to be this really high production. Ask your customers to be user generated. You could also just schedule a Zoom call with your customer and record it and that becomes a testimonial for you. Here are some tools that you could use. You could hire people on Fiverr or Upwork. For that video that you just saw, I used Animoto. It's a few hundred dollars a year. You could also use Canva. Descript is a really great tool if you haven't heard about it. It helps you audio, like the ums and the weird pauses, and sometimes you, that's a really good tool to use. And then we have Hippo Video for sales and Vineyard for sales. And then you could do StreamYard, which is this duck right here, to stream live videos too. So I wanted to give you all those options. Here's another one we did with Animoto, right? Like we, and you have, they have stock photos and video for you to use, but then you could also, you could also upload and go to Shutterstock and go to Deposit Photos and Pond5. There's all these different ones. There's story blocks that you can go ahead and snag B-roll from and stock photos from and put them into your videos. But these tools also have videos. I just wanted right here to reinforce that you actually need a little bit of a different strategy for all the different social networks, right? So the way that you talk on, on Facebook and Instagram is different than the way you would do something on YouTube. It's different than Twitter. So you need to make sure that you're editing your pieces that match that social network. Okay, it sounds like we've done a lot. We've covered so much in 25 minutes and I appreciate you staying with me. I have a few more tips to share with you. But in some ways, this is just when the journey is beginning. And you're thinking, how can this possibly just be the beginning? I've already done so much work. And yes, you have. But there's more work that needs to be done. Let me show you why.
because now that you got the lead to fill out on your landing page or your website on your forms, now you need to set up marketing automation and email. So for Magnet as this use case, we went ahead and set up a CRM for him. We used Active Campaign, but we really are big fans of HubSpot, but because he's a smaller shop, HubSpot's a little bit too expensive for his revenue. So we used Active Campaign and made it work for him. And we also set up Calendly. So we have where the person, the, the prospective customer can set up a meeting directly on his calendar for an in-person or virtual estimate. And we have that integrated onto the thank you page. We have that coming from emails where all the emails say, hey, schedule a time with us directly. And then it books his um, calendar out for him so he know he doesn't have to think about it. He doesn't have to go in this back and forth. Do you want to schedule a meeting with me? What time? Is Tuesday working for you? How about at 4.30? Honestly, we all hate that. Nobody should do it. I send everybody a Calendly link also. There's Chili Pepper or Piper. There's a bunch of other brands out there, so you don't need to do that one specifically. With marketing automation, it doesn't matter what time or day the inquiry is created. Friday night, no problem, because the system already has a cadence, a schedule to communicate, and it will look like it's coming authentically from a real person, but it's already set up on a sequence. So you don't want the lead to come in on um, a Friday night and nobody communicates with them until like Monday afternoon. No, 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 we don't want that, okay? You want to nurture, as I kind of mentioned this over and over again, it's about nurturing the prospect. It is about taking care of them and knowing that most people are not ready to buy. All right, so so many marketing processes are based on active buyers. So what happens is you'll send emails that say, you know, schedule a demo or buy now, but really only 3% of buyers are in market to buy right now. So that means 97% of people are, you know, maybe haphazardly looking for a few months from now. So what do you do? You need to woo these people. You need to build a relationship with them. And you don't build a relationship by constantly saying, will you go out with me? 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 So a lot of times when people set up their lead nurturing on their emails, that's exactly what they do. They constantly keep talking about themselves and how great it is. And if you bought me, if you bought this service or product, this was what would happen. What we have to do is create a um, value exchange. So that means that you're constantly making the, the buyer smarter, entertaining them, giving them something that they want to open up that next email. So how can you make their job easier? How can you make them look like a superstar at work? And if you're focused on those things, then people will continue opening your emails and continue engaging with you. But I wanted to say, so you have to nurture and you have to date and don't just kind of like, hey, they didn't buy right away. Most people will not buy right away. So only 3% of buyers are really ready to buy right now. So make sure your process whether you're an admissions counselor, that you have a good lead nurturing strategy, that you're going to send text messages, emails, and the same thing with any form of sales, right? So start having that social selling if you're a B2B buyer and you have an enterprise solution, really start building that relationship, start being a connector for people, so um, introducing them to someone else, really building value and ingratiating yourselves in their lives, if that's an enterprise customer and worth that effort. All right, so we kind of talked a lot about email, but it's really important, as we talked about earlier, that you have these call to actions and that you're driving them to fill out a form. Once they fill out a form, it's incredibly important that you then have that lead immediately go into your CRM of whatever you're using, Salesforce, HubSpot, Active Campaign, whatever it is, there's a million out there. And then you start the engagement process. So on our website, we have this amazing sales win ratio tip sheet. You can go ahead into our resource section of our website and then download it. So one of the things that I talked about is 40 to 50% of leads are hooked by the very first person they talk to. So make sure that's you and your organization. Calls under five minutes are 100 times more successful and two times more likely to qualify a lead if they contact that person within five minutes. Uh, there's five minutes. <laughs> five minutes of coming into the CRM. So do not do those things where I see people who batch leads that night or every week or they sit in a box or you come back from a conference and they sit around so somebody has the time to put them in. No, this is speed to lead is a huge portion of who's going to win. So make sure that your process is set up that when a lead comes in, you start engaging. And it is unrealistic to expect a human to engage. That is why you want marketing automation set up because if that lead comes in over the weekend, you want the system to start communicating with them and building value and showing that you are Johnny on the spot. Remember, you're 100 times more likely to contact a lead and 21 more times likely to qualify a lead if you contact them within five minutes. 
And there's other ways to do that. You can do that through your chatbot. You can do that through email. You can do that through phone calls, texts. There's a lot of ways you can engage with prospective folks and not always just through the phone call. For sales, more touch points and communication channels, the better, almost 170% better. So what does that mean, more touch points? I'm talking about like you have to communicate with them on email, text, phone, social media. So you don't want to just like call that person 25 times. You want to reach out to them on lots of different channels. And if you only reach out to them one channel, like let's say calling, you're 9.5% likely to win that business. But if you uh, reach out to them on multiple channels, you're 25% likely. So that's way upping the odds. So as I talked about with 10X, since we're talking about Magnet as a use case study, I wanted to show how applicable this is to all types of businesses and to really understand the why you want to improve your business processes, the why you need a really strong CRM. But a CRM by itself is not going to do those things. You need to create these um, playbooks. You need to tell the CRM what to trigger. Like if this person comes in, then this happens. One of the triggers that no one ever really does, and I'll tell you a big one, is inactivity trigger. Let's say the person hasn't scheduled a call, then you want something to happen. If that person hasn't done something, then you want something else to happen. So triggers of things that happen are really important, but it's also really important that you do triggers when things didn't happen. Keep that person moving along. For sales reps, best practice is say you want to make six phone calls per lead over the length of your cadence, and you put your chances of contacting that person 90%. Especially by call three or four, you really want to make sure your reps are calling at least, I mean, ideally six times, but a minimum of four, and most reps stop after call two. So there's a real disconnect. Three is where the magic happens, four is where even more magic happens, and then, you know, you get a little bit more at five and six. but make sure they call at least four times and that you're checking the call reports to make sure that happens. It's really important. Welcome emails have strong potential. That means an average email is open at 21%. That's of the people who fill out a lead form. But your very first email that you send someone is going to be open at 82%. And you know, it could be lower, but you want to have really strong subject lines. If your subject line is then you reduce your chances someone's going to open it. You want to use emojis even if you're a B2B a business. You're selling to a human being. You're not actually selling to a robotic business. So make sure you're being engaging and have personality. And then make sure your first email is not a squandered email that says, you know, we got your info. Someone's going to call, contact you. That is just completely lighting that email on fire. That's, there's an opportunity to ingratiate yourself. There's an opportunity to share value. There's an opportunity to maybe share your founder story have a video, have that person get to know you a little bit on that first email since it's going to be the most engaged communication that you're probably going to have with that prospect. Don't waste it. Don't. For every dollar you spend on email marketing, you could expect a return of $42. A lot of times people really underspend in email, and I see it all the time. They're not thinking about subject lines. They're not thinking about creative. They're not thinking about how can I add video. What's the story I'm going to tell? How do we get more testimonials or third-party validation in my email communication. So it's not just the mechanics of sending out the email, it rolls up to a content strategy. And what am I really trying to include in this? And am I helping the, the buyer journey? So, but every dollar you spend, you can get a great ROI on this channel. So don't underspend this channel. Here are some emails we did for Magnet. As you can tell, they're all a little bit different. This is Active Campaign, and like I said, we use we really like HubSpot also. But if you're um, on a tight budget, Active Campaign could be a really great one. So as you saw, there's like different automations that come. You can put people on different lists. You could send people out different email blasts, but you could also put them on different automations and workflows. So here's what really is important when you're setting up your CRM is the baton pass. It's, it's incredibly important. And what I mean by that is you, humans make mistakes all the time. So they say, I'm going to follow back up with someone. I could tell you stories where the the Google ads were costing $800 a lead, and then the person would call, like the lead would come in on a weekend. They wouldn't get called until maybe Monday or Tuesday. I'd ask the person, hey, do you mind calling me back? And they would never call me back. So that business owner just lit $800 on fire because that rep dropped the ball. So you want your CRM to set up that it rings them and like notifies them when they haven't done the next activity. And don't let your CRM sequence stop the second a rep engages with a person, you want, okay, if the rep engages with a person and then nothing happens after this many days, the CRM kicks back in. 
That is really, really important. So make sure that you are being clever and accounting for human error, accounting for mistakes that people have, you know, missteps, and that your CRM is, is making up for that. We want to alert the rep that that was missed, maybe alert the sales manager that, that something's amiss here, and, and really kind of catch things before they fall through that crack. So here is one with HubSpot. There are so many different choices in how you can set up your sequences and workflows, depending on what level of account you have with them. But these are so incredibly helpful. You could tell reps to do something. You could say managers to do something. You could have emails and text messages go out. So these automations are really powerful, and most people are not using them to their full advantage. Sure. Woo! You made it this far. Amazing. And I hope you got a lot of great nuggets. I have a few more things to share with you, but I wanted to say the bulk of the stuff over. And bravo for you caring about your business so much so that you stayed with us. I hope you found a lot of this to be really helpful. And if you want to keep learning and keep engaging under our resource section of our homepage, you're going to find we have guides, the, one, the two that I showed you with the funnel that was too small, and then also the sales tips. We have lots of webinars just like this one under resources also. And then if you could see right here, our blogs are so loaded with content. And you'll see not only we have lists and we have numbering and we have images. I just wanted to reinforce we have CTAs. You could also look at our blogs as a good benchmark for how your blog should look. So I wanted just to kind of give you that, that do not be afraid of images. Make sure you have lists and just reinforce that and make sure you create really great content. That was all one blog and it's not even done. So just to give you an idea how much content is in our blogs, but if you want to keep learning and growing your business, then definitely be sure to check those out. All right, so you are going to be a marketing and business superstar and take all these amazing tips back to your organization and you should feel really proud of yourself. Just a little bit about us, we do lead nurturing, sales enablement, advertising, websites, and everything under like identity. So, you know, not only logos, but wireframes and mock-ups and mood boards and what's your brand personality, because that, again, helps us dictate all the other elements, you know, car wraps, billboards, anything, advertising, brochures, you know, sales enablement, infographics, lead nurturing, emails, all that, all of that. All right, and don't forget to subscribe to our, we have a great YouTube channel. We have lots of videos on there. And then also subscribe to our newsletter. So this is something I mentioned, uh, I might have mentioned a little earlier, is a we have this great quiz on our website. It's called the Conversion Rate Optimization. And you'll get a score and you'll get an ebook. You answer a couple questions. So this goes back to the guy who's lighting money on fire. You really need to understand, are your pages converting to their full potential? And then there's best practices by industry. So if you're e-commerce, if you're business, if you're higher ed, we have um, benchmarks for you. And then lots and lots of tips. So some of the tips that we had in here, plus more on how to make your pages be converting machines. So be sure to do that. And then if you don't want to take the quiz, there's actually an out where you can just download the ebook for yourself. All right, thank you. Don't forget to take the quiz and cluck, cluck. Let me see if I could do that for you. There we go. <laughs> yeah, look at that, see? I will leave you with that. Thank you for joining. Have a great day. I'm Renee Seltzer, and you can contact me by email or visit our website and fill out a form if you want to learn more about how we could help your business grow, and you could be the next case study that we feature, quadrupling and 10xing your revenue, and that's really what we're trying to get to, is how do we grow your revenue and make you that like revenue-making machine. Have a great day, and we'll talk soon. Bye.